Hello, and welcome to another episode of Envisioneering Exchange, the podcast where industry leaders discuss the most important topics in sustainability, climate change, buildings, and urban efficiency. I'm Vic Marinich, Global Marketing Director for Danfoss, and I'm delighted to be the host of this podcast. You can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today, we have Steve Nadell from the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy on the show to talk about heat pumps and their role in decarbonization and climate policy. Steve is the executive director of ACEEE, a nonprofit research organization that develops policies to reduce energy waste and combat climate change. Steve, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm looking forward to our discussion. So maybe to uh, kick things off, can you tell uh, our listeners a little bit about your background and how you got involved in energy efficiency and climate change policy? Okay, this goes way back to the Arab oil embargo. I had just gotten my driver's license and I'd come home from school and my father who worked at home would say, oh, this gas station is open. Quick, could you go down and wait in line and fill up the tanks? I, From a relatively young age, I got attuned to uh, some of the uh, energy challenges In college, I did some work on environmental, urban, but also energy issues, which led to my first job working, uh, helping to lead energy programs for a nonprofit community group that was incorporating energy efficiency in uh, urban areas. And that I really enjoyed it. And that led to a whole series of jobs. And now I'm at ACEEE. Fantastic. So, And uh, ACEEE recently published a report, I believe you're uh, one of the authors on that report, on decarbonization and electrification options for single and multifamily housing. And now for our listeners, I will have a link on our show notes so they can uh, read that report. Can you tell us uh, what your research uncovered there? Okay. Let me first back up. We previously had done some reports that compared uh, electric uh, heat pumps to natural gas options. But if we're going to decarbonize, having full availability of natural gas is not going to be an option. So in this new report, we compared electric heat pumps using decarbonized electricity, largely carbon-free electricity, to fuels that are largely carbon-free, meaning uh, uh, biogas or uh, green hydrogen or synthetic hydrogen made from uh, synthetic uh, natural gas made from uh, hydrogen. Those alternative fuels are quite a bit more expensive than traditional natural gas. U.S. has fairly low natural gas prices, but these alternative fuels will be at least three times, if not even uh, four or more times more expensive. When you look at that, and we examined a representative sample of uh, over 2,000 homes in the U.S., most of the time... uh, the electric heat pump will have lower life cycle costs. That will be the better path for decarbonization. We found where temperatures, you know, routinely uh, get uh, fairly cold from about Washington, D.C. on north, you'll want a cold climate heat pump and not a conventional heat pump. Cold climate heat pumps tend to uh, keep their performance down to uh, roughly minus 15 uh, C. We also found where temperatures get really cold think uh, Detroit or uh, maybe just north of uh, Boston, you'll want a fuel backup. It will be a decarbonized fuel. And the reason for that is not that the heat pumps can't get you heat, but that the electric grid uh, will start reaching new peaks as the temperatures get really cold. And there's going to require a lot of investments just to serve a limited number of hours each year. And we found it will be more cost effective to have a a fuel backup rather than having to reinforce electric grid that much. So that was basically places that regularly get below about minus uh, 15C. Yeah, you you touched on a lot of uh, really important points there, really interesting points. So it's really great to hear the report emphasizing the value that heat pumps can bring to the market. Of course, not a new technology, but to see them coming more and more. And we do see a lot of local and even state governments, right, passing legislation that's going to ban fossil fuels in commercial and residential buildings uh, moving forward. So that that's going to, I think, drive the need for heat pumps even further as we go forward. But you kind of touched on it. I've heard uh, from a lot of people about concerns about the ability for our grid to absorb all this incremental requirements on electricity usage, right? We already know that it's a pretty stressed system. So as we're moving away from natural gas and from oil and and moving more to electricity, do you see this as being a big challenge uh, throughout the country or or only in those, uh, I almost said hot spots, but I guess really cold spots uh, in in the north where we need the heat pumps? 
in between. Most of the U.S. is summer peaking at the moment. So that means we have room for greater use of heat pumps. uh, But gradually, the winter peaks will increase. And by the 2030s, we're expecting most of the U.S. to become winter peaking, with the exception of California, Florida, a few other relatively warm places. It will only be winter peaking by a little bit. But as you start getting colder, then the winter peaks could be quite enormous. And that's why we recommend use of a backup fuel to prevent the really high uh, peaks in, uh, in those places that get below uh, minus 15 C regularly. You again touched on the needs for heating are going to vary by region and by climate. In your research, uh, how vast are the differences uh, that you found uh, across the U.S. in terms of heat pump adoption and the benefits that uh, we would get out of them? Right. The benefits are definitely greater in the South. They have limited heating needs. Heat pumps tend to work better when the outdoor temperature is not that cold. And the South tends to have, uh, in the U.S., uh, lower electricity prices for historic reasons. So that's the first place to start converting. Also, the South uses a lot of electric resistance heat. So they might have a central air conditioner, but electric resistance heat. And we think that's a prime opportunity to use heat pumps because the heat pump will be much more efficient than the electric resistance And the incremental cost is pretty small for a heat pump relative to a central air conditioner. But as you go farther north, you will start needing cold climate heat pumps. And then in the very cold regions, we think you will need uh, some type of backup fuel for when it gets uh, really cold. So it sounds like maybe there's some uh, technical, I don't want to call them barriers, but technical issues we need to address as we move further north. Are there any other barriers that you see to a heat pump adoption? And are there maybe some policies that can be put in place to lower those barriers and make uh, heat pumps even more accessible? No, there definitely are barriers. The average American homeowner probably doesn't really understand heat pumps. They need to understand. It almost sounds too good to be true. They Create heat out of cold air. Oh, come on. That must be a crack of something. So we have to educate the consumers. Frankly, we have to often educate the contractors. Some of them are familiar with heat pumps, but a lot of them are not. Particularly as we start getting into cold climate heat pumps, the more sophisticated controls that might be needed to switch over from the cold climate heat pump to a backup system. So there's definitely a lot of need for uh, education, both of the consumers, but also of the uh, uh, contractor community. Cost can be an issue. If you just use a conventional heat pump, uh, usually not, but the cold climate heat pumps are significantly more expensive at this point in the U.S. So can we bring the cost down? Electricity rates can be fairly high uh, in many northern states, and we might need new electricity rate structures that... uh, basically recognize a lot of the benefits of heat pumps so that the heat pumps effectively don't subsidize other uh, customers. And there's all sorts of uh, details there, but uh, we probably need to re-examine rate structures to fairly uh, charge heat pumps without uh, unduly transferring costs, particularly to low-income homeowners. So that's something. Uh, We have limited availability of the whole home cold climate heat pump. So how do we get more of those and can we improve their performance? Uh, U.S. Department of Energy has an initiative now called the Cold Climate Heat Pump Challenge, where they are challenging manufacturers to improve their heat pumps, including doing such things as full heat output at minus 15 C. Because normally the efficiency as well as the heat output declines as temperature gets colder. It will still happen, but they're looking to be able to do full heat output at minus 15 C. And that's one of the reasons we suggest the need for backup only below then. We're assuming these uh, cold climate heat pump challenge products do will become widespread by uh, the 2030s. A couple of other things in the U.S. We do have a number of houses with hot water heat. I know those are very common in Europe. But presently, there is very little available in the way of air to water heat pumps. I know a few manufacturers are getting ready to introduce products. They're widely sold in Europe, but we need to uh, bring those to the U.S. And then just to mention one other challenge I forgot to mention before, we looked at single family and multifamily. What I said applies to single family as well as low rise multifamily. But when you get to high-rise multifamily, we found that the decarbonized fuel may be the cheaper decarbonization option, 
it gets difficult to install heat pumps on high rise buildings. You know, you might need cranes, et cetera. And typically the energy use is relatively low, lots of shared walls. So that would be one other place that we might uh, say for high rise buildings that decarbonized fuel uh, may often be better than a heat pump. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned uh, education. I think heat pumps, they've been around a very long time. And some of us who have also been around a very long time can remember decades ago where maybe they didn't have the best reputation. And it seems that that image kind of has carried forward, even if it's been 40 years or whatever it's been, right, since that first uh, uh, heat pump. I, I remember I looked to put one in my house uh, 30, 40 years ago when the contractor said no way, right? But it seems that that's still pervasive in our industry. And we really, I think uh, that's such low hanging fruit that we can get that education and, and get people uh, trained. Right. Uh, we have to educate people that it's not your grandfather's heat pump. Exactly. That's right. That's right. But an example might be, uh, you may recall that compact fluorescent lights originally got a bad reputation. They took forever to go on. They, you know, flickered, et cetera, et cetera. It took a little while, but we, uh, we got the LED bulbs and now they are widespread in uh, much of the world. You know, people are literally apprehensive, but they did, based on experience, become comfortable with them. So, and as we talk about the energy transition, and maybe this is more on the commercial side than, than the residential, right? There's always a concern about CapEx costs, first costs on those projects. And we know a lot of the, let's say, small to medium-sized buildings, it could be that the building owner isn't necessarily the one paying the utility bills, right? They're, they're going to uh, put that onto their tenant. So how do we address this issue when we want to increase the capex put in a heat pump into a, a lot of these buildings but then the person who's going to benefit from the lower energy cost isn't the one paying the capex is, is there something that policymakers can do to maybe address that gap as well yeah there are a few things that uh, might be helpful one there might be financial assistance for the building owners to install the heat pumps recognizing that uh, this would be in the interest of the tenants uh, who more often than not might be uh, you know, a more moderate income. Another thing is to help educate the tenants about the energy use of apartments, the relative energy use, about uh, what type of heating system a building may have, and can we create more of a tenant demand for high efficiency, you know, decarbonized apartments. Uh, I know in the case of commercial buildings, for example, in the U.S., that uh, LEED certified buildings have higher occupancy rates and uh, higher average rents. Can we change the market so tenants start, uh, rental tenants start demanding that and maybe we can make it more in uh, landlords' financial interest? Yeah, I think it's a, yeah, those are all good points. Um, so as we look on the infrastructure upgrade, it's not only the, the building owners that'll have to do some upgrading, but certainly the utilities, I think, too, are probably going to have to do some upgrades to their systems and that we know typically is going to get passed along to the consumer, the electricity. So as we, again, make this transition away from natural gas, away from oil and towards electricity, if the utilities are making these heavy investments, do you think we're going to be able to keep our electricity rates to a level that allows everybody to participate in this uh, revolution? I think we can, but we have to be very careful about, uh, you know, which costs we want to incur. You know, do we really want to build lots of new generation plants to only operate a few very cold hours a, a year? But, you know, the heat pumps will create electric demand over many hours throughout the winter. And that actually, in some many cases, will help lower electricity prices because the uh, generation plants will be uh, better utilized. But yes, we have to look at what some of those key peak costs are and how do we keep them down, whether it's use of backup fuels or just to mention another idea, it has to do with electric vehicles, but electric vehicle fleets will require lots of uh, power at a particular point. So how do we reinforce the grid at those points in ways that uh, is very orderly and keeps costs down? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, everything uh, at the end uh, seems it's all tied together here as we move to a more electrified uh, economy. So in your study, you talked about both uh, single family and multifamily homes. Can you maybe come back and talk about the challenges of electrification in multifamily homes versus the single family home? Right. I mean, there's several challenges. As you noted, uh, in many cases, the tenant pays the heating bill and therefore that reduces the uh, landlord's incentive. In the United States, I believe at least half of it, uh, the time the uh, landlord pays the heating bill. So they have that interest in uh, 
improving things. But there are a lot of places uh, where that's not the case. Uh, so that's uh, one challenge. The equipment sometimes is uh, a little different. You know, it's probably going to be more use of mini splits rather than whole home systems. Sometimes there's centralized systems that you might uh, then need, you know, more of a chiller type uh, heat pump. It's going to be a little bit different there. And then, as I mentioned, uh, high rise buildings tend to provide their own challenges. If they have a central heating system, yes, you could put a chiller uh, system in. But if they don't, you know, it's little individual gas heaters for each uh, apartment or something. Installing uh, mini splits on a high rise can get uh, challenging and maybe uh, we'll stick with the decarbonized fuel. <laughs> right. Yeah. Good point. And you mentioned there a little bit on the commercial building space as we get away from uh, residential. We know that buildings are responsible for 40 percent of the carbon emissions in the U.S., right? So it's a, it's a uh, significant part there. How can heat pumps, you know, do they present an opportunity for the commercial building space as well? Absolutely. There are lots of heat pumps that will work in commercial. In the United States, they tend to fall into two categories. You have what we call rooftop uh, systems, which are effectively larger versions of residential-like systems located on the roof. And those are generally available in heat pumps. And how do we switch over to them? Many manufacturers, they'll give you a, a model with uh, electric resistance. They'll give you a model with a gas heater installed called the gas pack, or they'll give you a heat pump. How do we transition much more to the heat pump? But for larger buildings, we're going to need more like chiller heat pumps. Those are a bit more widespread in Europe, but they are starting to come to uh, uh, the U.S., uh, particularly in those cities that have enacted, you know, building and uh, performance standards, uh, you know, and said we want to decarbonize like New York City and Boston. I know the building owners are already starting to think about, OK, when my chiller goes, maybe I need to install a chiller heat pump. Right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the the cold climate challenge uh, that the OE has going in. If I remember, maybe three companies have already uh, come to market with their solution to the cold climate challenge. And uh, also, if I remember right, that we're, then we're talking those rooftop units that you mentioned. So those are typically small to medium sized buildings. As we look at colder climates, um, you know, I think there is still a concern out there. So can electrification be done in those areas, do you think? across the board, or do you think we'll be limited to maybe single multifamily homes, smaller buildings? How do you see that going? In the warmer climates, you can do everything with a heat pump. In the colder climates, you might want to have a fuel backup for, you know, maybe what our research indicates, maybe that last 10% of the load. Again, you could do it with a heat pump, but it's going to require a much larger system and the economics may not pay for that. Right. So just replacing that chiller with a heat pump may not be uh, the way to go up north. You want to replace the chiller with the heat pump, but then you want some type of backup fuel system that can ultimately be decarbonized to, uh, you know, help supplement that. Right. But if you only have a chiller, you've probably got a boiler sitting there already anyway. So you've got the, the room, you've probably got the infrastructure to support hot water distribution, right? Right. And you may need a smaller boiler, uh, particularly if you uh, make the building more efficient, but also the Heat pump will continue to provide heat, but it's a question of when it gets really cold, does it provide enough heat or do you have to supplement it? So everything we've been talking about uh, up until now has been on uh, commercial or residential buildings, right? So uh, keeping people uh, comfortable. How do you see heat pump technology if we look at it more broadly, right? I mean, you mentioned uh, briefly, right, there's hot water heating, right? Maybe district heat, uh, maybe even some industrial processes that today are using natural gas uh, for heating. Do you see heat pumps being able to move into any of those sectors and what kind of uh, technology gaps do we have to overcome to be able to get them uh, more broadly uh, implemented? Right. No, heat pump water heaters, for example, I think will become widespread. In the U.S. now in homes, we require the larger water heaters to be uh, heat pump water heaters. And there's a reasonably proposal by groups such as ours, as well as some of the larger manufacturers to move that size threshold down for where we're going to require use of heat pump water heaters and not electric resistance heaters. And the economics for heat pump water heaters, uh, we found, tends to be much more favorable relative to decarbonized fuel. So, you know, as long as there is space to put a heat pump water heater, we think most homes and many uh, commercial buildings will move to electric heat pump water heaters. Industry is another large opportunity. A lot of uh, process heat is at low to medium temperatures. Presently in the U.S., you can uh, 
buy industrial heat pumps that will get up to about 160 C, but there are products being developed that will go up to 280 C. For U.S., about half of uh, industrial process uh, loads are below 160 C, so we could do that. And if you eventually get up to 280, that's 70% of process loads. So we do think that uh, industrial heat pumps uh, will be a major uh, source of process heat in the future. I would note, uh, I'm hearing from our European friends, that uh, industrial peat pumps now are selling like hotcakes because they have restrictions in the amount of natural gas available due to the Ukraine uh, war and you know, shut down the Russian gas. So uh, people are buying as many industrial heat pumps as people can supply, which will really help accelerate the transition in Europe. Yeah, and I can uh, confirm that the same talking to my uh, counterparts over there in Europe. Heat pumps across the board, the industrial, the single multifamily, the commercial heat pumps, uh, everybody is uh, driving to get uh, get something to get away from uh, from natural gas. So maybe we'll give you uh, just one last uh, wrap-up question here, Steve. What are the next steps for uh, ACEEE's research on electrification? Right. We continue to look at best practices. What are the programs uh, that are working? What are the ones that are not One big thing uh, we haven't mentioned is the U.S. recent uh, climate package included about four and a half billion dollars for incentives for uh, residential heat pumps and heat pump water heaters. We also have new tax credits. So we'll be working to make sure to help advise on how those get implemented, both at the federal level when they where they set the final rules, then at the state and local level where a lot of the marketing and implementation will take place. We continue to do uh, research on, uh, you know, uh, decarbonization pathways. We'd like to do some more on the commercial sector, for example. We're planning to do a lot more on uh, industrial heat pumps. And then the residential sector, we're particularly focusing in on how do you make sure that as you electrify, that benefits everyone. There's concern if the uh, middle and upper middle class all electrify gas prices are going to go up uh, for the remaining customers who might be the lower income. So how do we help make sure lower income start converting the heat pumps at least as quickly, if not even quicker than uh, uh, the higher income uh, customers? Fantastic. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Steve. And that's it for this episode of Envisioneering Exchange. I'd like to thank my guest, Steve Nadell, Executive Director of ACEEE for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to Envisioneering Exchange on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate, review, and share it with your network. Thanks for listening and talk to you next time. This podcast is for information purposes only. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Envisioneering Exchange podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and not necessarily represent those of Danfoss LLC and its employees. Danfoss LLC is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the podcast series available for listening on this site. This podcast series does not constitute professional advice or services. This podcast, including Danfoss LLC and the producers, disclaim responsibility from any possible adverse effects of information contained herein. Opinion of guests are their own, and Danfoss LLC in this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility of statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about the guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. This podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute this podcast. The developers of the Envisioneering Exchange podcast site assume no liability for any activities in connection with this podcast or for use of this podcast in connection with any other website website, computer, or playing device.